All right. So some of you have been working on this with your midterm projects where you needed to either read from a file or write to a file to kind of save some information. When we deal with files, there's usually two key properties. We have the file name itself and then a path that goes with that. Um, the path specifies the location of that file on a computer. For example, if I have documents here in my, um, my documents folder on my laptop, then I would have a file called project.docx. So this here is a file. This here is the directory or the path that we're going to go to in order to get to that. That's obviously different depending on what operating system we're on. So in a Windows system, C colon front slash there, forward slash is going to be part of the path that is called the root folder. So the root is going to be that first part, this part up here, um, which contains all the other folders. On Windows, that's C or the C drive. In Mac or Linux, that's known as just the backslash, which is going to be the root folder. Um, and most of the material that Al uses here in this is going to talk about Windows. However, some of you are working on Linux and Mac, just know it goes the other way, which means that we will use some path modules so that it will determine what our operating system is so we don't have to write code that only works one way or the other. And you should be using that module that we'll talk about. You could have additional volumes on an operating system, such as your D drive or E drive, if you have jump drives. Um, maybe mounted drives, et cetera, they're going to show up there. In Mac, that's going to show up under the volumes folder. And in Linux, it's going to show up under the mount folder or the MNT folder. All right. Uh, folder names and files are not case sensitive on Windows and Mac. However, they are case sensitive on Linux. All right. Does anybody have any questions on how that works? All right, again, on Windows, paths are written with backslashes as the separator between the folder names. In Mac OS and Linux, they use a forward slash, which is their path separator. So if you want your programs to work on all operating systems, you will have to write your Python scripts in order to handle both cases. Thankfully, this is pretty easy to do with the path function from the pathlib module. So you'll need to pass it a string of the individual file in the folders in your path. The path function will actually return a string for you, which is the file path with the correct file separators. So what does that mean? If we have to import path, so from pathlib import path, then we pass in path, spam, bacon, and eggs, it's gonna return us the correct format based on what operating system we executed this on. So if we executed this script on a Windows system, it's going to return us back this string. Therefore, we can put that string into our script and use it accordingly. So as you can see here, we pass that into the string function. We get back the specific string that we're looking for. Notice that there's two slashes in here for each one of these. Remember, that's going to escape the first slash. So when we have that in a string, we need to have two in there in order for it to work. Anybody have any questions on how path works? You guys will need it for the homework assignment this week. All right. So even though Windows uses backslashes, the Windows path representation and in the interactive display will use forward slashes. So since then, you um, everything software developers, et cetera, tend to use Linux operating systems, so they always use the other side. So here's another example where we want to join the name of a list of file names at the end of a folder. So we would do our import path. We have this list of file names. So accounts.txt, details.csv, and invite.docs. We loop through this particular list and we're going to attach the path, the appropriate path in front of it. So for us, we're going to pass it to the path of C users L, and we will end up getting the output of the exact path for those files. Now, the good news is, as far as your homework assignment, I want you to work in the same folder that you're already in. So when you go to import things, you don't necessarily need to use the path um, module in order to do that. Um, I don't want you trying to go out to reach to another folder. 
if you guys try to reach out and put your, say you download your text file and put it in a folder, and then you write your script <clears throat> to read from that folder. The problem with that is, is when you submit your homework assignment, I don't have your folder. So I need you to just import it in a way or read that file in a way that it imports in the same directory as your Python file. This homework assignment, it's gonna be very important that you guys name your homework assignments accordingly and appropriately. In other words, I have you specifically naming the file that you download from the internet, which is a text file. You need to make sure that you're importing from that file name. Why? Because I just need that one file in my, my folder. I can put all of your guys' homework assignments in it, and it should be able to read from that one file all the time. Don't submit your the, the text file that you download. Okay. So we can work through this, the path, let's get through here. So if we need to figure out what our current working directory is, normally when you execute scripts by default, you're going to be working in your Python directory. You guys may have seen that when I bring up something like idle and I create a new file, then I go to save that file. By default, I end up in my Python directory. So in this case, it's C users, JLZeller app data, Programs, Python, Python 3.10. You normally don't want to save files in that location. That can cause problems. So you want to save that into a different location. If I want to save a file or work with a file in a different location, I have to change my working path within my script to be in a different folder. So by default, if we run the command path.cwd, it's going to return me whatever my current working directory is. If I want to change that directory, I need to make sure I import the OS module, and then I can use the command os.chdir and then tell it to change to whatever directory I want. Once I'm there, I can rerun my path.cwd and confirm that I'm in the correct path. So you would write your script in a way with if statements to make sure that you are in the correct path before you save your file. Does everybody kind of understand what I'm talking about there? Okay. Um, if you try to change to a directory that doesn't exist, you're gonna get an error in here. And then you could use your try and accept statements in order to um, get back feedback to the user so they, they don't crash in a way such as this. Um, before we had the path module, which is kind of recent in the newer versions of Python 3, we used to have to use the command os.getcwd, which is very similar to the path.cwd function. Path just made things a whole lot easier. So when we started teaching this class, you had to use the os way of doing things. It was a lot harder, a lot more complicated. This path module, so from pathlib import path, it's a whole lot easier now. Okay, home directory. As you guys know, if you worked on your computer, you clicked on your little file browser and you're going to get your home directory over here on the side. This has your documents, your pictures, etc. If you want to get to that home directory or if you want to find out what that home directory is, you just have to type path.home with your parentheses and that will call that in order to tell the user what their home directory is. So it's common for you guys to write your scripts in a way that you at least go to your home directory, then maybe create a folder in there, then place the files inside of that. That is a much better place for your Python programs than going out to the Python directory. A lot of that deals with permissions as they're saying here. So you're gonna have permissions to your home directory. You may not have permissions to save things inside your um, Python folder. All right, please ask questions on this stuff if you guys don't understand it, because it's going to get dense here in just a little bit. All right, so with absolute and relative paths, there's two different types of paths. This will be important for when you guys take your quiz next week. An absolute path always begins with the root folder. A relative path is relative to the program's current working directory. So if you guys download a Python file or you created a Python file, you save it in your home directory. When you launch that Python file, it's going to have a current working directory of your save folder. 
okay? You can use a dot and dot dot folders and you'll see this, you guys may have seen these before. So dot dot slash is a relative path to your main C drive. If your current working directory is bacon, then it's just dot slash. The reason this is important is on your guys' homework assignment this week, I want you to use relative paths, meaning that you don't need to put a path in. It's going to assume that the text file is in the same folder as your homework assignment. Does everybody understand that? I get people that submit absolute paths and then it's, you know, in this case you have C, Jason, blah, 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 blah. Well, if you put it over there for Alexander, then it's going to be C users, Alexander. I can't launch your file. Your program crashes. So please use relative paths, which means it's going to assume it's in the same current working directory the program was launched from. Okay. Again, dot is similar or shorthand for this directory where dot dot is referring back to the parent directory. So you can move backwards, you can move to the current directory, or you can use the full absolute path over here. It's not very common that you want to use the absolute path unless you are modifying a system file, right? If whatever your Python program is doing, if you're modifying a system file, then you would want to write that out to an absolute path. Otherwise, it would be smart to use relative paths accordingly. All right, if we need to make a new directory, we can use the os.makeDirs function. So again, you need to import os before you start and you can use the make dirs, and then you pass in the path that you want to create. When you use make dirs, it will not only make this file of delicious, it will also make the folder of walnut, and it will also make the folder of waffles. In other words, it will create any intermediate folders that are necessary until this full path is existing. So if you don't have those folders, it's going to create them for you. In order to pass this in, notice this is an absolute path that's been hard-coded. We can also use our path command from pathlib in order to send that in. What's nicer about that is that we can just use the dot make dir function directly off that path, and it will go ahead and create that. The only caveat is it will only make one directory at a time, and it will not make subdirectories like the OS make dirs. So it's nicer to actually use the old one so it'll create all the intermediate folders that you would need. All right, you have a couple of functions that are gonna help you test whether or not you are currently using an absolute path or a relative path. So again, .cwd is gonna get you your current working directory. You can use .cwd and say is absolute, which is going to make sure that this is an absolute path. All right, if you check to see that your own concoction here is an absolute path, it's gonna return back false. Does everybody see why this one's false versus this one here? You're not going clear back to the root directory. You're not going all the way out and specifying the whole path. This one is specifying a relative path to you. So this becomes the relative path that you would get versus this one, which gives you the absolute path. Okay. You can also use os.path in order to check for absolute paths um, and, and work that way down here. Again, for the purposes of your guys' homework assignment, this isn't going to be relative to that. But if you are doing something with a bunch of files inside of your midterm projects, you would want to pay attention to this so you can figure out how to get absolute paths or relative paths. All right. When you're dealing with the path object, which is what we've been dealing with so far, We've talked about a couple different things here. So our drive is C colon. Our anchor is C colon forward slash, right? Then our parent is going to refer to the user's al uh, section of that. And then our file name is spam text with spam being the stem and text being the suffix. If you were doing this on a Linux operating system or a Mac, you're gonna see something like the one below. You have slash home, slash al, slash spam.txt. 
you'll need to understand this stuff for your quiz. So what parts of the file name are what? Okay. That should get you through there. Um, let's see. You can use um, OS path in order to calculate um, what the file names are and the directory names. So if you need to chop up that a little bit better, OS path module is going to help you get different parts of that path right now. So um, you can also use uh, split in order to tear that out. So if you have a string like this and you only want to know what the file name is, then you can use os.split um, and that will go ahead and split that into a tuple where the first part is your directory, the second part is your file name. All right, that should get you there. Um, a couple of other things you can do is you can find different file sizes and folder contents. This won't be relative to your homework assignment, but it would be relative to some of your uh, midterm projects. So you can use the module OS path get size and then send in a path. It will return you the size of the file. So for example, if you use this one here, which is list dir, it's gonna list all the different file names in a given folder. You could then, do a loop through that uh, list that would then go and call get size and you could get the file directory, which is very similar to me going to a command line, typing LS, or if you're in Windows, um, you could list out those files and you would get the name, the file size, et cetera. Um, that's what you guys can essentially recreate that if you want. If you wanna get a total size, you can do that too. That's what this whole section's talking about. Again, not relevant to your homework assignment, but maybe relevant to your guys' midterm projects. If you need to modify a list of files, you can use the glob method here. All this does is allow you to um, set different patterns, kind of think of it like a very simplified regular expression that we did before, which allows you to find certain files. So for example, if we say our path is this, and we do dot glob to asterisk, which means pretty much find everything. We pass that into the list function. We're gonna get back a list of a, um, a glob or all the files that are in that folder. So that way we can um, find whatever we may want to find in there. You may do that like here where you could say glob dot text and it pulls back all the text files. You may wanna do it for dot docs and it's a way for you to find dot docs. If you use the question mark in there, it's going to stand for any single character. So for example, if we have project question mark, it will find project two, project nine, et cetera. Um, but it would not find project 10, right? Because we're only looking for one character spot. And you can use combinations of those. All right. You can also need to check whether or not that path is valid. So if you're trying to create a path and you need to figure out whether it's valid for your try and accept statements, you can use the path and then use dot exists or is file or is directory in order to get that true or false information back. So is this path that I have, is it a file or is it a directory? You can get true and false back. All right, again, I know that's really dense and a lot to cover. I'm trying to focus on just the stuff you need for the homework assignment, um, but some of you guys may need this for your midterms. I've had a lot of people email me about being able to read and write files. Okay. When you want to read from a file, which is what we're going to get into now, particularly we want to read from a text file in this case. We would start with from path lib import path, and then we set our P variable here as our path and then whatever the file name we want. This here is considered a what? Absolute or relative path? What's that? Re relative, relative, right? So this is a relative path, not an absolute path. This is what you will be doing in your homework assignment. So if we actually fired up our interpreter line here, which is what I got over here, and we say from path lib, import path, then we can say p equals path. We just pass in the file name that we're wanting to create. So in this case, we're gonna call it spam.txt. Uh, oops, forgot my capital P, case matters.
Okay. And then all I want to do is I want to write text to that or write something out to that text file. I would use p dot write text. And then I could pass in whatever string I want to write. So if I say hello world. It's going to tell me how many bytes I came out. Now notice it's different than what's on the screen because I didn't put the comma in there. I wanted to show that there's a difference. It will give you the total byte count there. Whoops, I hit my screen. Sorry about that. Of how many that you wrote out. And that would just, in this case, reflect how many characters that are actually out here. Then p.readText is going to read whatever information back out of that text file. So if I say p.readText, it's going to give me back a string of whatever I typed in there. If we go out here to new file and to open, whoops. Because I executed this in my Python directory, if we actually do a look for text files in here, we will see our new spam.txt file here. And if I actually open that as a text file here, we can say this is my text and just put a bunch of garbage in here and we save it. If I do the p.readText again, notice that it's going to import all of that stuff that I typed in. So this is how you can read from a text file. You can modify your text file in your normal notepad, and then you can have Python actively try to read that information in. What do you mean? No, there's a reason for that, right? So you're talking about all this stuff here? Yeah. That's because there's new lines in my actual text file. Right? So if I go new file and I go look at my text file that I had in here, see how I had this spacing in here? Yeah. It's pulling all of that in. It's going to read it line for line in there. So if I actually take what was coming back, say I put contents equals p dot read text. Now, if I print my contents, it will print it exactly the way it was in that word text document. Good question. Okay, that's how we use read text. Um, in the old ways of doing it, and you, if you look at other code while you guys are working through stuff, we used to use an open function, which was part of a file object. So you would have to import the file stuff and you would read or write on that. You would also need to close that. Uh, we're gonna cover that a little bit now, but that path one is just a really basic way of dealing with files. If you wanna do more modifications, you'll need to actually use an open function here, right? So the way that works is, is you give it a variable name like open or a hello file. You're gonna say open, you pass in a path and then you pass in the file name. You can pass in a path object, you can pass in a relative file. So the equivalent is, if we look over here, we said p.readText or here is where we created that file. We would do something similar with my text file equals open. And then we would pass in that same thing, just spam.txt. And now I have that file open. I can read from that. I can do whatever I want. So it'd be my text file.read. And you're going to read everything in just like you would have on the path. The other advantage is, is you can use my text file.read lines. And you're going to get that out. Now, right now, there's nothing in there because we already read that file. So if I do my text file dot close, and then we launch that open again, once you read it, it's already assuming that you pulled with that text. So you have to do this in a line. So if we do my text file dot read lines and we say my contents equal my text file read lines. Now, if I look at my contents, I get a list 
of all the different chunks that were inside of there. So it reads line by line through that text file, which is a whole lot better than a whole lot of text being dumped on the screen. So this comes back to what you were asking about, Grant. Is there a better way to read it in? Yes, you would use read lines so that now you could say four line in my contents, print line. And it would go ahead and print line by line, but you could also then search through those lines. You could uh, change contents of those lines, et cetera. So read lines is a little bit nicer. If you have a lot of lines inside your text file, you would want to use read lines versus uh, just straight read. All right, that's what this is going to talk about. So read is going to read in your file. Um, you can use read lines that gets you back a list of the string values of each line. Um, and you're going to see this sonnet stuff here. This is talking about similar to the homework assignment. From a command line? No. No, you're trying to launch it in whatever's native to your program. Like you want to launch it in Notepad? Yes. No, you would have to read it into Python and then you could display it. Okay. Unless you called, I mean, you could use the system argument in order to go tell it to launch Notepad and then pass the path to Notepad and then it would launch it. Yes, I mean, you could do it that way. A little more complicated. Um, so when we're using that open that we were talking about, by default, when you call open, like I did here, right here, you would normally pass in a variable right after spam.txt. So spam.txt is our file name. By default, we are saying that we're just going to read this file. It's read only, okay? If we want to write to that file using the open command, then we need to pass in a W. And that W puts us into write mode when we open that file. Then we can write text out to the file, but we must close the file when we're done. So anytime you read in contents or you edit a file, you will have to close that file. Otherwise, the, the system basically locks that file so that you can't modify it. If you remember when I was out here, I went out to the notepad file, changed a bunch of stuff, and then told it to print it out. It can do that with the path, but I can't do that with open. Open locks that file once I read it. There's two different write modes. There's write mode, and then there's a pen mode. So write mode is going to overwrite the file. If I call it with a W, whatever was in there, if I overwrite it, it's just going to lose everything that was in there. If I pass an A, which means append, I'm going to add to the end of the file. So if you have like a running text file that you're saving a bunch of information in, you would want to use append as opposed to write. Again, the difference is, is you're using open with a comma W to write, a comma A in order to append. You could use a comma R if you want to read, but you don't have to. It's implicit. Anybody have any questions over that? You will want to know that for the quiz next week. There's some quiz questions around that. Okay. So some of you have been messaging me to how do you save information? Like I run my program, for example, say you're building a class roster, right? And your program builds a class roster. You want to save that data because every time you end your program, you lost everything you typed in. There's a couple different ways to save your data with the variables that you're using in Python. You could put it out to a text file, which I don't recommend because then you have to read and write that information out. You have to keep it clean on how you write it. It's a little more complicated than that. If you want to save your variables in a Python program, you can use a shelve method or a shelve module. Um, what this is going to do is you import shelve, you create a shelf file, you say .open my data. You have something like this. You have cats equal to a list. You say shell file cats, which is going to take this list and say equal to cats. It's going to save it out to that file. All right. So here's the problem with using the shell. You're going to end up creating like three different files 
and you're going to have something like mydata.back.dat.dir. This is a little more complicated to use. If you try to read that back in on a different operating system, it's not going to work perfectly. So it's platform specific as to how you're going to use it and how you're going to bring things back. I would recommend that you would save variables using the pretty print P format function. And so if you guys remember pretty printing back from page 118, in this case, this refers back to dictionaries, it will print the list of a dictionary or a uh, list to the screen. While this particular function, instead of pretty print dot pretty print, which is what you guys used, if we use P format, it's going to return that same text as a string as opposed to printing it out to the screen. Then we could actually send that to our text file or whatever we're going to save it as. So if we look at import pretty print, we have this list of dictionaries inside of it. And that's set to this variable. If we run pprint dot format of cats, we're going to get this exact line in, right? And we can set that inside of our file. So if we say open, notice that we're creating a file called mycats.py, as opposed to a text file, we're actually creating a Python file. We use the W in order to write to that file. Then we use a dot write command. And we say that cats equals that pretty print with a new line. We can then close that file. At that point, what's going to happen is, is we will get a Python file that looks just like that. So if I come up here and show you this example, we import pretty print. We have a line like this, which is a variable that has a list of dictionaries. And if we run pprint.pformat of that variable of cats, we can see that it prints it all out nice and clean, exactly the way we would expect it to be inside of a Python file. So then we can go ahead and create a file here. In this case, we created a file called my cats. Notice that because I'm using idle here, it's going to save it in my Python directory. I should save this out to my home directory or something else is better. We're then going to take that pretty print output and actually write it to that file, such as that. And then we need to always close our file. So file obj.close. And if I actually went out to that folder, so if I go to file open, you will see I now have a my cats Python file. If I look inside there, it's exactly what you would expect if you guys were writing your own code for this in here. So if I had created my own my cats file and dumped this information in there, it would save it. The benefit to doing it this way is now over here in my project, all I have to do is import my cats. And I can now import that file into my main file. So a lot of you guys right now, your midterm project's getting huge, right? You've got a lot of text in there. You've got a lot of dictionaries, whatever else is in there. It would be nice to take that data, move it over to a separate file, and then import that into your main one. Just makes it nice and clean for you to actually see what's going on. When you do that, you use import whatever that file name is. Notice I don't put the .py attachment there. It's just my cats. Now, because cats is a variable in there, I would call that with mycats.cats, and I would get that directory. In this case, it's a list of those dictionaries out. And I could reference each one of those. So if I say mycats.cats, and I say I want the first index of that, it just gets me back to first directory. And if I say I want this, and I just want that name variable, I get back the name out of that first list. So this way you are creating your own Python files where you can store information, you can modify information and then save it so that the next time your program launches, you could do that. So you would write code in your midterm project to say, import this file if it exists. If that file does not exist, don't worry about importing it. We'll go ahead and create our new stuff. We'll save it out as a new file. Then the next time the program launches, you tell it to check to see if the file exists. If it does, go ahead and read from that variables. Then you guys can reuse those as opposed to having to recreate it every time.
Another way of importing this, so if you noticed here, I said import my cats. If there's only one portion of this file that I want to use, for example, I only want to use this variable of cats, then I would say from my cats, import cats. And so now instead of me having to say my cats dot cats, blah, 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 I can just say cats and it gets me back that same information. So if you want everything out of the file, then make sure you import cats. You just have to reference it. If you want to just pull one or two things out of there to modify, you would do it this way. Anybody have any questions on that? Again, I know that's what hit your homework assignment. Okay. Today covers reading and writing files. In a, a short term, we're going to work about organizing those on Wednesday. So we'll have another actual recording on Wednesday that will cover all that other material. I strongly encourage you guys to go through a couple of these projects in here. It will make your homework assignment a whole lot easier. All right, this Mad Lib project here used to be a homework assignment that every student did. Um, I've now changed that. So I encourage you to go out and try to do this assignment. That's one that students before you that used to be their homework assignment. Now they're actually doing the one that you guys have, which is dealing with this assignment for here. Too many students were cheating on this one, so. Can't cheat on this one, unless you found last year's homework assignment. Anybody have any questions? Again, on Wednesday, we're gonna go through organizing files and I'll get you started on assignment four. And I promise I will get all of your content graded, your midterms, I'm gonna to try to get them back as fast as I can. That way you guys know where you're going for your midterm pro or your final project. If for some reason I feel like you're not on the right path and something went wrong with your midterm project, I'll ask you to schedule a meeting with me. Please schedule a meeting with me. Those of you that have stopped by my office, emailed me, try to get information on the homework other than texting me on Saturday or Sunday and saying you have an issue. That didn't work out for some of you students. But if you guys try to get a hold of me, I will schedule time. Grant can attest to that. All right. Thank you.